Number five, The Conjuring. The Conjuring is a 2013 horror film directed by James Wan, written by Chad and Carrie Hayes. It is the first film in the Conjuring universe franchise and also based on real events surrounding the Perrin family's demonic experiences. Ed was a World War II vet and a former police officer who became a self professed demonologist. Lorraine, a self-claimed clairvoyant, making them the best demonic duo out there. In 1952, Ed and Lorraine founded the New England Society for Psychic Research. They quickly gained notoriety as respected investigators after this case, the Perrins. In 1971, the Perrin family moved into a 14-room farmhouse in Rhode Island where Carolyn, Roger, and their five daughters began to notice odd things happening almost immediately. First missing items, salt shaker, broom, then some ghostly sightings. Then, well, you'll see. It was discovered that the home had experienced some previous sinister owners, self-emulation, deadly accidents, and of course, murder in the attic. One violent and destructive spirit named Bathsheba. Quote, whoever the spirit was, she perceived herself to be the mistress of this house, and she resented the competition of my mother posed for that position. Andrea Perrin, the oldest daughter. Bathsheba Sherman, who lived on the Perrin's property circa 1800s, was rumored to have been a Satanist and involved in the murder of a neighbor. According to the oldest daughter, Andrea, there were numerous spirits that lived on the premises. The smell of rotten meat, beds levitating, and of course, the dirt covered, abysmally cold basement. The parents asked the Warrens to come in more than 10 separate times on 10 separate occasions to help out their ghost problem. Lorraine conducted a seance to attempt to contact the spirits that were possessing them to which during the seance Carolyn Perrin was possessed. The family swear that she was speaking in tongues and even rising from the ground sitting in a chair. Andrea said my mother began to speak a language not of this world in a voice not of her own. Then her chair levitated and she was thrown across the room. Yeah that uh, that's all the ingredients you need for an amazing horror movie universe to me. Terrifying. Number four, Annabelle. The infamous Annabelle. We know her. The most haunted doll on earth. First appearing in The Conjuring in 2013, then Annabelle, then Annabelle Creation, then Annabelle Comes Home. I'm just waiting for part four. Annabelle versus Anderson Silva, UFC 279 live from Las Vegas. Yo, I'm straight up punting a haunted doll if it runs up on me, I'll tell you that for free. The film was inspired by the story of a doll named Annabelle, told by Ed and Lorraine Warren after obtaining and ridding its evil from its toy-like body. The doll is apparently responsible for two near-death experiences, one fatal accident, and a string of demonic activity. The doll's origins come from a gift to a young nurse named Donna from her mother for her 28th birthday. Donna brought it back to her apartment she shared with a roommate, pretty normal Raggedy Ann doll. Then the two began to notice she'd move around on her own. They even started finding notes left around saying, help me, written on parchment paper, which they had no clue to even where to buy that or find that. Before long, they called in some help from a medium who insisted that the doll was harboring a spirit who had lived and perished on the grounds prior to their building being built. Medium called the priest, priest called his father, his father called Ed and Lorraine. So yeah, this thing is like haunted, haunted. You know when priests are like, oh God, oh God, no. Yeah, that's usually not a really good sign. Spirits do not possess inanimate objects like houses or toys. They possess people. An inhuman spirit can attach itself to a place or object, and this is what occurred in the Annabelle case. This spirit manipulated the doll and created the illusion of it being alive in order to get recognition. Truly, the spirit was not looking to stay attached to the doll, it was looking to possess a human host. Thank the gods, Ed and Lorraine locked her up in the occult museum where she lays to this day. Just waiting. Number three, The Haunting in Connecticut. The Haunting in Connecticut is the first of the Warren universe of horror and is based on all real cases and points. A 2009 gem, it accounts the horrific paranormal case of the Snedekers, who moved into a ghost infested house in Southington, Connecticut. Carmen and Alan Snedeker, their three sons, their daughter, and two nieces, all unwillingly now pray for the other side. The eldest Snedeker son unfortunately was diagnosed with Hodgkin's lymphoma and the family moved to Connecticut to be closer to the doctors. What they weren't initially aware of was that the home they were renting was once a funeral parlor. Yeah, tools and bloody furniture just lay as they once did, untouched. Mom notices items going missing, 
that's just the start. The children start to see strange people in their home at night, specifically a man with long black hair. Their son's drastic personality change, which included violent outbursts and attacks on his family, was then diagnosed with schizophrenia. No one was convinced though. It was agreed that maybe he was becoming a victim to the house's grim history after all. After weeks in the home to get the full demonic experience, the Warrens came to the conclusion that the morticians that worked in the home previously had, had practiced some abysmally sinister acts on the lifeless bodies, deepening the home in a twisted dark origin. After Ed and Lorraine were called in to clean it up, an exorcism or two and the house finally became a home again. The case can be reimagined in 2009's Haunting in Connecticut where the story follows the the truth the Snedekers experienced all those years ago. It's pretty scary. Yeah. Number two, The Nun. The 2018 spin off film and prequel to The Conjuring 2. A demon nun channeling an evil spirit named Valak. The Nun serves as an origin story of sorts within the Warren universe. Sister Irene and priest Father Burke travel to investigate a monastery in 1952 Romania after the Vatican learns of an accident and summons the father to investigate. According to the Lesser Key of Solomon from the 17th century, Valak is the grand president of hell. Valak's look in both films were inspired by an experience Lorraine had shortly after investigating the Amityville Horror House in 1976. Lorraine was at home in her bed reading when she felt a presence. She saw a black whirlwind of dark mass enter the room. It was like a vortex. Lorraine prayed to be released from the forces of evil. She told it, leave and go back where you came from over and over again. It vanished, but she never forgot. And cue scary movie. Yeah, apparently while investigating the once very haunted Borley Rectory, the most haunted spot in the UK, Lorraine had a run in with a sinister nun. They ended up coming face to face with the churchyard's ghost who was according to lore, a nun buried alive behind the brick walls of the convent centuries ago after having an affair. Apparently Ed took photos on his camera of the Borley Rectory ghosts as they encountered them. Quote, it was pitch black and there were no lit candles or lights. Photographers snapped photos on a 35 millimeter camera with infrared film. When they developed the images, what appeared to be a spectral nun was seen walking down the aisle praying. And number one, part two, The Conjuring, The Devil Made Me Do It. Sounds like a lame Satanist excuse, doesn't it? Actually, now a term of phrase pleaded before a court of law. Yeah, who knew? Could possession under demonic circumstances prove innocence over acts performed while under? This is the eighth installment of The Conjuring universe. The plot is as follows. It's 1981. Ed and Lorraine documented the exorcism of eight-year-old David Glatzel, attended by his family, his sister Debbie, her boyfriend Arne Johnson, and Father Gordon of Connecticut. During the exorcism, Arne invites the demon to enter his body instead of remaining in the boys. The family, including the Warrens, witness the demon transport itself from David's body to Arne's body while he suffers from a heart attack and is taken to the hospital unconscious. Arne and Debbie return home, but Arne is left feeling a little unwell and eventually ends up murdering his landlord, stabbing him 22 times due to this demonic possession. Yeah, sounds pretty terrifying, doesn't it? His case becomes the first American murder trial to claim demonic possession as a defense. Well, sorry to break it to you, but this is literally a play by play of the events that actually happened. Yeah, maybe not shot for shot movie style, but the script and skeleton was there for sure. Arne was subsequently convicted after a messy murder trial, though he served only five years of a 10 to 20 year sentence. The case was huge. It attracted huge media attention and in fact was the first in history of the US claiming the paranormal as a defense. The couple went on to marry each other, Aw, and tell their story as the Warren side as well. Books, documentaries, and eventually this huge film universe. Number five on this list is The Haunting in Connecticut. This haunting is the haunting of the Snedeker family. List verse writes, after renovations on the house were complete, Carmen Snedeker entered the basement for the first time. There, she found embalming equipment and body tags with the names of the deceased. The family soon realized that the house was infested with demons. Carmen witnessed the water in her mop bucket turn a different color. She recalled the mop water was blood red. I mean a deep, deep red. It made my skin crawl. The middle son said the lights were coming on and off and on and off even though there was no bulbs in it. Ed and Lorraine Warren assisted in performing an exorcism on the house which has brought closure to the family. Since then, no further paranormal activity has occurred. The Snedker family remained in the house for two more years before they relocated to Tennessee. So guys, all of this is well and good and it's what the Warrens want you to believe. Is it true? Probably not. 
You see, they had someone come in and write a book about the events that happened here. He went in and interviewed the family multiple times and it turns out that they couldn't keep their story straight at all. They were all over the place and it felt like nobody actually knew what happened. Then he went to Ed and told Ed that he can't write this story because nobody has any idea what actually went down. And you know what Ed said? Just make it up. That's literally what happened guys. The story about this place is just made up and it was probably never even true to begin with. Also, while literal mop buckets were filling up with blood downstairs, the upstairs neighbor was totally fine and just living their life. Seems kinda strange that the demonic possession would differentiate between floors, but I guess that's what the Warrens want you to think. Number four on this list is the Vampire Girl. Now this is one of those cases that, if it's true, doesn't get enough of the limelight. The Warrens have dealt with werewolves before, and we actually looked into the South End Werewolf and what it's all about in one of our previous videos. But this vampire case... It never really gets talked about. The Warrens were brought in to deal with an 18 year old girl who was going down a path of vampirism. This girl was very interested in death and the underworld. She started performing satanic rituals by herself and as you'd expect ended up becoming possessed. The possession was clearly vampiric in nature and the demon was hungry for blood. It's said that she would wait in cemeteries for unsuspecting victims and then attack them right when they got there. It was reported that 16 people were bitten by this girl and she would actually drink their blood. To my knowledge, nobody was killed, but there were obviously some pretty serious injuries involved. Now what strikes me as odd is why this case hasn't been discussed more. It almost feels a bit like a secret because it's never brought up and largely forgotten about. Yet, when you consider what actually happened and the events that transpired, this is one of the most shocking things they ever did. The fact that we don't bring up this case and talk about it more actually leads me to believe that if there is any truth to be had in the Warren's exploits, it might be here. Maybe they were actually trying to protect the world from the truth here. The truth that vampires are potentially real. Number three on this list is Ed's relatives. This is something that really doesn't get mentioned a lot, but Ed Warren saw demons just like the rest of the people he tried to help. I think the media often portrayed the Warrens as these almost superhuman individuals who were impervious to the will of paranormal entities, but... Ed certainly struggled with this growing up and for much of his life. Apparently, Ed would be frequented by the ghosts of long past family members. These paranormal entities would speak to him and tell him to do things. He was pretty private about what they would say to him, but we know that he did in fact get frequented by them. Who knows what they could have told him to do though, or how long he was seeing these visions. I think the reason that this was kept under wraps for a while was to preserve Ed's image as the person who comes in and saves people from these paranormal entities, rather than potentially somebody who suffers from them as well. Number two on this list is Aaron Shayan Johnson. This is the the infamous devil made me do it case. Arn Shayan Johnson killed his landlord in 1981 by stabbing him to death. When he was brought to court though, he claimed that he was not in control of his actions and the devil literally possessed him and made him do it. Now this is pretty serious stuff, so how does Ed and Lorraine Warren fit in? Well, it's been speculated that Ed and Lorraine might have made the entire thing up, which effectively means that they were trying to get a murderer to go free based on a blatant lie. Johnson had a brother-in-law whose name was David. David was mentally ill. He needed professional help. The Warrens saw this as an opportunity and decided to try and exploit it. They came in and tried to manipulate the family to say that David was initially possessed with a demon and that Johnson came in, told the demon to take his body instead, and saved David from said demon. If the public believed this, then the Warrens would be smack dab in the center of a massive demon demon case. David and his family would get a lot of money from publicity deals, and the murderer Johnson would get off scot-free. It was a win-win-win for everyone except the justice system. Well, David's family wasn't happy about it after some thinking. They ended up suing the Warrens, claiming that they manipulated them and tried to get a guilty man to walk free. Which if everything that I just said is true, they did actually do. Just another secret that came out that 
They didn't want to be revealed. And finally, number one on this list is Annabelle. In our last part of the series, we were breaking down some of the Warrens' cases and talking about how some of them may have been fraudulent. Well, a lot of you were commenting on that video asking about one of their most famous cases that I haven't brought up yet. Annabelle. The Annabelle doll is one of the most widely known cases that the Warrens participated in and would probably be on most people's list when it comes to the creepiest dolls to ever exist. This doll even inspired the creation of a horror franchise of the same name that's had three separate installments in it. Pretty good notoriety for an inanimate object. Or maybe inanimate is the wrong word when talking about Annabelle. The legend began back in the 1970s when a young nurse named Donna received the doll as a gift from her mother. The doll took up residence on her sofa and at first was a nice and calming little plush toy that had nothing demonic about it at all. Soon things started getting a little bit weird though. Donna would go to work and find things out of place or doors open that weren't that way when she left. Then her and her roommate started finding notes around the apartment. Tiny little scribbled notes on parchment paper that would read, help me. Finally, it all came bubbling up when Lou, Donna's boyfriend, was in her apartment one afternoon by himself. The most common version of the story says that he was napping and then woke up to the doll literally trying to kill him, strangling him until he finally had enough strength to throw it off of him. Apparently, he even had several scratch marks on him for a few days, but then they went away after that. This is when Ed and Lorraine entered into the mix. They took the story and absolutely ran with it. Apparently, as they were taking this doll, which they had determined was possessed, as they were taking it back to a safe place, it tried to crash their car several times and only putting holy water on it would stop this interference. Of course, no one else was actually in the car at the time, so we just sort of needed to take their words for it. And that's actually the thing with this story. The only actual evidence or proof about this doll is that they told people it was haunted. There's no video of it moving, there's no pictures of it acting crazy. Anytime I've seen it, it just looks like a regular doll. Because of this, we can't say that it's fake, but we also can't really say that it's real either. I will say, after everything we revealed in the last video, I'm starting to have a hard time just accepting what Ed and Lorraine tell me. So honestly, Annabelle being fake could definitely have been another one of those secrets that they just didn't want us knowing about. Number five on this list is the recording of an exorcism that Ed and Lorraine wore. Warren facilitated on a man that was possessed by several demons. Before I break it down, let's roll a little bit of a clip so you guys can get a sense as to how far gone this man actually was. What other entity is inside you? God is commanding you. In the name of Jesus Christ, and all the saints, and all the martyrs, and all the angels command you to answer that question. What is it? Abaddon. Abaddon. Okay, who else? Who else is within you? Answer the question. So as you can see, Ed is standing with a cross to our man who is possessed and basically holding these spirits at bay, trying to figure out exactly who and what is inside of him. He mentions two names in that clip, Avatar and Maveth, two very inhuman and demonic names. He also isn't acting even remotely okay in this video. Clearly there's an inner battle going on between this man and the demons that are inside of him. Later in this clip, when the man was asked why these demons were inside of him, this is what he responded with. Why are you in Roberto? Why are you there with Roberto? Jesus Christ doesn't like demonic spirits within a human spirit. Jesus Christ hates demonic spirits to be within a human being. Do you know that? You hate Jesus, huh? The man clearly says that the demons are in him for power and that he hates Jesus Christ. Incredibly chilling stuff, if you ask me. Number four on this list is a clip from another exorcism that Ed and Lorraine were present at. In this video, we're going to see a priest performing the exorcism, and the biggest takeaway that I got from watching this recording was simply how far gone this person who was being possessed actually was. Let's roll the clip. This is the exorcism part right here. You'll see the spittle come out of his mouth. Ed 
as we can see in that clip, my guy is drooling and he looks to be in really rough shape. Later in that clip, he looks up and you see his eyes and there just doesn't look to be any semblance of a human being left inside of him. He looks completely gone as if there's no soul present in his body. Apparently, he was the target of regular demonic possessions and had to employ Ed and Lorraine's help to try and get the demon out of him. I can't even imagine being so possessed to the point where I'm drooling and seemingly not in control of my thoughts. Really scary stuff. Number three on this list is a clip of Ed Warren talking to a poltergeist in a family home. Apparently, this family has been haunted by this ghost for quite some time and have now had to enlist the help of the Warrens to free them from its clutches. In the first clip, Ed is going to be asking the ghost to knock on the walls of the home to answer his questions. Are you a boy? The mother leans against the kitchen table, her hands in full view as Ed continues asking questions. You want the people in this house to move? One knock for yes, two for no. Yes. Okay. As you can see, the mother's hands are in full view of the camera and no one is making the knocking sound. This ghost has also revealed itself to be a young boy who wants this family to get out of his presumed home. I also think that the mother's reaction is extremely chilling and genuine when she says that they tried and they couldn't sell. The clip gets even more chilling as it goes though. And you to reveal your identity. Next, Ed decides to confront the poltergeist alone. Give me some sign. Is that you moving something? Give me some sign that you're here. As we can see in that clip, the chair clearly gets moved by an unseen force. They eventually brought in three exorcists to assist in getting this demon out of the house, and it seemed to work when they did it. However, Ed and Lorraine both admit that sometimes an exorcism can only work to quiet down a ghost and that it can sometimes come back several months or even years later. Number two on this list is some raw footage from an exorcism that Ed and Lorraine performed on a Buddhist monk. This was posted on their official YouTube channel roughly a year ago and it's pretty jarring. Let's roll the first clip. I'm here to help you. I'm here to help you, Teresa. <laughs> I'm here to help you. Think of your mother, Teresa. Do you see your mother? No, I can't see your mother. Your mother. Your mother. Your mother. She's talking English, Ed. So as we can see, the person in question is in very serious trauma and their body is squirming in unnatural directions. They seem to calm down at the mention of their mother though, so potentially that's a way to reach the human soul of this individual. As the clip continues, Lorraine attempts to further calm the person with the mention of their mother, but eventually this stops working and the demon takes hold once again. The person is in full distress now, rolling all over the ground, and it seems as if their entire body is in agony. They also don't seem to be making any sense with what they're saying, just strange, unsettling noises. The clip doesn't inform us at the end if the couple were successful in their endeavor to get this person free of this demon, so sadly, we're just left with the horrible image of them demonically twitching on the ground. Number one on this list is from the Enfield Poltergeist. Now, this story is one of the most famous Ed and Lorraine Warren tales and inspired The Conjuring based on how terrifying it was. If you aren't familiar with this case, then it was centered around a home that had paranormal activity happening from 1977 to 1979. Furniture moving, levitation, and demonic possession, those all took place. Potentially the scariest thing to come out of it though was a recording captured of the demon speaking. Taste the blood died, I How could blood? Then I had a language and not fell asleep. And I died in a chair in the corner downstairs. That clip is the demon speaking about how it died in this home. What's absolutely insane though is that was a young girl who was making those sounds. Now how on earth could a child make those sounds and speak that way? 
The only explanation is that she must have been possessed by a demonic presence. This case got national attention after that recording was released and after hearing it from myself, it makes sense why. <laughs>